Welcome to FieldShed Connect, a higher education open educational resource application. FieldShed Connect contains higher education materials which are useful for teaching, learning, and research purposes. It allows learners and educators to access content anytime, anywhere, free of charge. No registration needed. Just type in the keyword of the topic you wish to search. Click on the categories of the Philippines Standard Classification of Education and browse your way to its rich content. FieldShed Connect is easy to use. Just key in your area of interest. The site offers different relevant and interesting materials to choose from. Scholarly prepared, accomplished, and uploaded by competent faculty members and contributors from various partner Philippine higher education institutions. Guided with the principles of open educational resources, these materials such as PDF, audio files, ebook, presentations, videos, and many more are very beneficial. Field Chat Connect, we educate as one.
Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending the 10th webinar of the Higher Education in the Context of Bangsamoro Organic Law, also known as the HECBOR Project of the Commission on Higher Education. This is in partnership with the Ministry of Basic, Higher, and Technical Education of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. We are broadcasted live via HECBOR Facebook page and YouTube channel. I am Jean Hesuro, and I will be your moderator for this afternoon. Our webinar for this afternoon is entitled Shaping the Future of Higher Education in the Post-Pandemic World. This webinar will focus on the multi-level impacts of COVID-19 pandemic to tertiary or higher education on a global perspective and opportunities and recommendations in coping with the challenges it brings. To formally begin our webinar, please help me welcome Commissioner, Chad Commissioner Perfecto A. Elibin for the opening remarks. To the officials of the Commission on Higher Education, our friends and officials from the Ministry of the Basic, Higher and Technical Education in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao, presidents and heads of institutions, administrators, teachers, friends, viewers, and supporters of this webinar, a pleasant afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the 10th webinar entitled Shaping the Future of Higher Education in the Post-Pandemic World of the Commission on Higher Education, Higher Education in the Context of the Bangsamoro Organic Law, or the HECBOL Project. The topic for this webinar is very timely, especially to the education sector, as this creates a positive vision of the future amid the current challenges on how to sustain and provide quality education despite the many constraints. Data shows that as of April 6, 2020, UNESCO 2020, there has been almost 2 billion affected learners out of the 91.3% total enrolled learners in 188 countries in all levels of learning. In the Philippines, a statistical reports from the Department of Health showed that the COVID-19 pandemic is increasingly on the different regions and causes a massive impact on higher educational institutions. The schools in the country immediately opted for alternative modes of delivery, and teachers are called upon to be even more innovative to deal with flexible learning. As a support, the Commission of Higher Education has assisted higher education institutions to move to flexible learning. And this includes capa capability building or training of faculty members, helping universities and colleges to set up their learning management system and putting together their resources in preparation for the opening of classes this first semester, 2020-2021. In this slide, the PIL Chad Connect launched on June 23, 2020, was a response to the need of the schools to access materials online and enrich their learning management systems. This online platform 
is a collaboration effort of LCIs and is aimed to help in ensuring the availability of learning resources during these critical times of the pandemic. The Commission has been supporting the SEIs for higher education institutions in the Philippines through project proposals and research activities, faculty training and on flexible learning systems related to the instructional delivery and student assessments and other educational and administrative challenges, particularly in bridging the digital divide on the part of students. On a lighter note, however, let us all be reminded that the global pandemic has opened up opportunities to upgrade the educational mode of delivery in light of emerging technologies. Higher education institutions, especially the academic administrators and heads, need to seize this opportunity to strengthen evidence-based practices provide accessible medical and mental health related services and make the curriculum responsive to the needs of the changing times to all the students and stakeholders. Opportunities and challenges must be considered for the future educational landscape amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. The future of higher education must be continuously relevant and dynamic to prepare the human resources and the future generation on the requirements of the 21st century. The great challenge is on how to provide and deliver quality education amid these trying times, like the COVID-19 pandemic and other disasters, and to what extent are we prepared when another crisis comes our way in the future. On a brighter side, I am equally happy that in this session, a very credible, competent, and renowned international speaker and co-director of Asia Pacific Higher Education Research Partnership in Hawaii, the USA, will be sharing his expertise in higher education. His professional expertise Community researches and field works have significantly helped in the transformation and evolution of education across the world. On a personal note, I have personally known him when I had a short educational engagement and immersion at the, West, at the East West Center and the University of Hawaii. With this, I am expressing my sincerest gratitude to Professor Dean Edward Novaver for accepting the, is, this invitation. Thank you, Dean. On a final note, let us continue to work together and never be disheartened by this setback. Let the vision be our guidepost for the future. The process may not be easy. But when we persist to find meaning, gather data, seek reliable sources, it is only then that we continue to progress towards the attainment of a lofty vision. Vision can create a positive and creative mindset. For the future, as we learn, rise above the struggles and hardships we have encountered we have become more united, humble, and resilient, and should learn as one. To all leaders in higher education, let us put in mind that in our leadership, we can transform this good vision into reality. Thank you very much, and may we be inspired. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner Alibin. To those who just tuned in, welcome to Shaping the Future of Higher Education in the Post-Pandemic World. 
the 10th webinar of the HECL project of the Commission on Higher Education. Without further ado, let me introduce our resource speaker for this afternoon. He finished his bachelor's degree in political science at the University of California, Riverside, and earned his master's and doctorate degrees in political science from Yale University. Some of his recent engagements were as consultant to East West Center, International Forum for Education 2020 Project from 2004 to 2012, Distinguished Visiting Professor in, at North, Northeast China Normal University, Changchun, Jilin, China, in 2007 to 2016, a board member of the Center for Curriculum Services Incorporated from 2009 to 2016, consultant to Fujian University, Taipei, Taiwan in 2012, a member, Council for High School Education, Higher Education Accreditation Governing Board at the, at the International Quality Group Advisory Committee in 2012 to 2016. He is currently a scholarly assessment research panel at the Humanities and Social Sciences Panel of Research Grants Council uh, University Grants Committee in Hong Kong since 2013. He is a member of the Exploring Higher Education Issues in Contemporary Japan since 2018, an advisory board for the Entrepreneurship Education since 2017, editorial board of the Journal of African and Asian Local Government Studies since 2018, reviewer of local administration review in Bangkok, Thailand since 2019, series co-editor of the International Higher Education, Palgrave Macmillan and Springer Nature since 2019, Editorial Advisory Board of Asian Education and Development Studies for 2000, since 2020, a research, Senior Research Fellow for Globalization Research Center in the University of Hawaii, Manoa, since 2004. Ladies and gentlemen, the co-director of the Asia-Pacific Higher Education Research Partnership and our distinguished resource speaker for this afternoon, Professor Dean Edward Neubauer. Good. Good afternoon, good evening from Honolulu, where it is just evening. Uh, I want to thank Commissioner Eldon for that uh, uh, very friendly and, and uh, charitable uh, and useful introduction to uh, this proposal. Uh, what we will we'll do this evening for the next uh, 40 minutes uh, plus is to try to assess how higher education is being affected by the pandemic. And then in the latter portion of this presentation, move in the direction of making some uh, explicit suggestions about how components of the higher education system shall uh, proceed. In uh, accepting this invitation, I chose uh, to conjoin it to other work that we have been doing uh, at the East West Center and with our colleagues throughout Asia to look at uh, another event which was shaping higher education significantly prior to the post-pandemic world because I see these things happening together. And as you'll see through the PowerPoint, this is to try to assess the effects of the emergent uh, fourth industrial revolution being affected by the very rapid growth of artificial intelligence in the world. So if we could have the first slide, please. So I have been uh, impressed in, as, as have many people uh, in the world at what it means to have uh, a pandemic. We have had multiple viruses of significant import in uh, the world in the last uh, two to three decades, uh, from AIDS to SARS to others. But um, we're now fully aware of the fact that this is different. And it serves to put it in the context, for me, it serves to put it in the context of the flu pandemic and to try to have some sense of how transformative the flu pandemic of 1918 was. Uh, if we look back at that, uh, it took place in a world that had a, a global population of only 1.6 billion, uh, whereas the current global population is 7.8 billion, uh, significantly uh, higher. Um, if we look back uh, at uh, 1918, 
we can see that uh, 500 million people uh, contracted the flu. Uh, if we were to just take, uh, there are many, many, many models of how the pandemic will proceed. But if we just took that as a baseline estimate, we would uh, realize that uh, up to 2 billion people would uh, at some point be affected or, or, or contact uh, the flu in, in uh, this year and the coming year. Uh, an event of uh, unprecedented uh, dimensions in um, human history. So um, it is presumptuous on all of our parts to uh, pretend that we know how this is going to play out but as uh, in an effort for on all of our parts to be responsible to the nature of uh, the challenge, uh, it, it behooves us to do so and to try to create discourses that are useful to, um, in which to place our, our activities. And uh, this is the spirit in which I've tried to uh, do this presentation uh, before us. If we could have the next slide, please. So to, uh, to get a, a, a better handle on 1918, uh, I picked up a, a recent, a wonderful book uh, by Laura Spinney uh, uh, called Pale Rider, The Spanish Flu of 1918 and How It Changed the World. Um, and the answer is it changed the world in many, many ways, but the bottom line is that it changed the world substantially and irreversibly. And um, I know it's easy to say something like that, but as we begin to put that in the context of our daily lives and our institutional lives, we then have to move from, uh, from the level of rhetoric to the level of uh, institutional and empirical activity. What does it mean to change the world that we currently live in substantially and irreversibly? Uh, and uh, without uh, taking that one too far, uh, the notion of irreversibility uh, in, in uh, higher education discourse is both there as a fundamental premise, but it is also there in uh, a way um, that uh, is not determinative. And what I mean by that is that higher education as a process is meant to be something uh, which is reciprocal and not uh, irreversible. No, it, I don't want to be too mystical about that, but simply the point is that um, uh, an event of the magnitude uh, of the flu of, of 2020 is going to affect the world uh, in ways which uh, to some extent are uh, un unimaginable. So having accepted uh, this uh, daunting uh, limitation. Uh, in, in what follows, I want to point out some probable impacts uh, of the current pandemic on the future of higher education. Uh, next slide, please, Jane. The, uh, the pandemic arri has arrived just on the heels of what by itself would be uh, an event of um, perhaps equal proportion. Another way that we could talk about, and, and many people are talking about the, the uh, condition in which the world finds itself, uh, at least uh, in the last decade, is that uh, the degree to which uh, industrial uh, artificial intelligence is impacting the world uh, has begun to change it in ways which are themselves irreversible. So even without the pandemic, uh, uh, a number of scholars and, and uh, significant others in the world have felt comfortable calling uh, the, uh, the impact of artificial intelligence the fourth industrial revolution. And in doing so, I think we have two, um, two choices before us. On the one hand, we can just see that it's a, a nice catchy phrase for talking about something that perhaps we experience in multiple minimal ways uh, in our everyday life. Um, uh, we, many of us don't use cash anymore, 
Uh, we, uh, our banking uh, activity, which used to be organized around one set of social behaviors, uh, has been transformed and in a relatively brief period of the world, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We could find uh, uh, dozens of ways in which our life has changed as a result of the way that technology has uh, come about um, us in the, in the past several decades. Those who are proposing this notion of the fourth industrial revolution, however, are pointing out that artificial intelligence has uh, captured that process, which has been ongoing for the last three, three and a half decades, and accelerated it uh, in many, many ways, and then more importantly, transformed it. And it is this transformation uh, which has um, caused us to look at it in and of itself. Uh, so if we could have the next slide. In hunting around to suggest useful ways to talk about this, uh, I've been impressed by uh, the words of Carl Schwab, who uh, has uh, the founder of the World Economic Forum, who in 1916 uh, provided this statement, which uh, I'll read just so that we all have it, and which uh, was the early portion of a book uh, by the same title, which he has subsequently published. But if we just go through this and think about it uh, as, as I read through it, it is quite stunning. We have yet to grasp fully the speed and breadth of the, breadth of the new revolution. Considered the unlimited possibilities having billions of people connected by mobile devices, giving rise to unprecedented purchase processing power, storage capacities and knowledge access, or think about the staggering confluence of emerging technology breakthroughs covering wide ranging fields such as artificial intelligence, robotics, the internet of things, autonomous vehicles, 3D printing, nanotechnology, biotechnology, material science, energy storage and quantum computing to name a few. Many of these innovations are in these, their infancy, but they're already reaching an inflection point in their development as they build on and amplify each other in a fusion of technology across the physical, digital, and biological worlds. And the point that I want to make this afternoon is that this reality of, of which we all participate in, in one or multiple kinds of ways, and which we had already started to normalize uh, <clears throat> over the last five years of the past decade, is what's being interrupted by the pandemic. And by being interrupted, it doesn't mean that it's going to go away, but what it means is that its dimensions will change. And let me just mention uh, a two that uh, I've come across in the last several days uh, in the United States, and that is the realization that the, uh, the role that the, the global technology companies are playing in our economies is being significantly uh, accelerated in ways which were perhaps un unimaginable six, eight, 10 week, uh, weeks and months ago. Uh, and the heads of those companies who are becoming amongst the richest people in the world, which is another way of saying the most powerful people in the world are being in a position to affect society uh, in, in uh, dimensions that were perhaps unimaginable. Uh, and if we have time in the questions, we can talk about that some more. Uh, but the point that I want to make here is that uh, the notion of it as a fourth industrial revolution is not idle. Uh, it signifies the fact that uh, life is not going to be the same in massive, uh, significant ways. And it follows from that, as we'll talk about more and more as we go through this, that uh, education and higher education themselves are not going to be the same and uh, will be forced to change uh, if, uh, if they do not choose uh, to do so in a voluntary, productive way. Next slide, please. And <laughs> following that up, Ilsa Kong uh, came to uh, a conference we had at the East West Center in 2018 
in which we were talking about the same kinds of things. And he provided this statement, which um, once again, I thought uh, said it about as well as could be. Frequent job changes would require genuine lifelong learning and training. And, and just underscore that, genuine lifelong learning and training, not something that happens when we've already got our learning done and we just wanna add something, but the basis of what uh, learning will become. In this situation, won't the current four-year university system soon be obsolete? How about the present rigidly organized system of major fields separating humanities and social science from natural sciences and engineering? And let me just interject and say, we'll come back to this, but that is a pivotal question, uh, certainly in the United States for how we do uh, higher education. And uh, it is uh, uh, now, or Salkong's uh, sense that we uh, don't pay attention to these things at our peril. The, to go on, the inevitability of high job mobility would require both labor market flexibility and new social safety nets for workers. The existing industry-based labor market policy needs to be reoriented towards protecting workers, not jobs. Uh, next slide, please. So just uh, a, a, a few more views on uh, the impact of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, here's uh, Farnam uh, uh, Harian, uh, who's the president of Carnegie uh, Mellon, uh, Carnegie Mellon, I'm sorry, University, uh, who um, made this uh, argument at a, a subsequent talk. Uh, and note that the figures here uh, were pre-pandemic in terms of their uh, implications. A dozen technologies are predicted to drive change in the near future that will have an economic impact by 2025, uh, which uh, when I initially put this slide together, it was in 2018, uh, five years hence of between 14 and $33 trillion a year. Just uh, extraordinary. One third of the global GDP. And then Marker has looked at uh, this in terms of, uh, of jobs. And, and if you're interested in this and uh, you get into it, you'll find out that there is a whole growth industry of which the next uh, bullet here uh, uh, plays to as well, Daniel Sussheim's book, which I put together in, in the, the references uh, for this. And what they're trying to do is to figure out how jobs will be affected and given the fact that higher education throughout the world has increasingly over the last four or five decades become focused on uh, job preparation in some sensible kind of way, these are uh, extraordinarily important kinds of estimates. So to go back to Marker, uh, he looked at uh, data compiled in 2015, which suggested that the average worker in the United States would hold 10 different jobs by the age of 40. And some research, uh, and I cited here the Forrester research, which you can look up, suggests that the young job seekers today will hold 12 to 15 jobs in their lifetime. Uh, and we are seeing that uh, throughout the United States that increasingly uh, the, the, the phenomena that we call jobs are, uh, are just being transformed right before us. And I, uh, uh, to my regret, have become far less, um, Akamai, that's a Hawaii word that means uh, knowledgeable uh, in the political economy of the current Philippines, but uh, I would be extraordinarily surprised if these dynamics are not being uh, operated there as well. So uh, Forrester suggests that by 2025, 16% of all U.S. jobs will be replaced while the equivalent of 9% jobs will be created, resulting in a net loss of 7% of jobs by 2025. That's a very conservative uh, estimate. The report also specifies that office and administrative support staff will be in those areas of work most disrupted by such automation and the use of robots. And what's important about these kinds of estimates to which we add uh, Susskind set by 2030, up to 40% of existing jobs will disappear, is that they're not just talking, although uh, in, in 
uh, these cases are mainly Americans, they're not just talking about uh, America, North America, or even first world countries. They're talking about the way that work is done uh, in the world and the fact that human work will increasingly be replaced by uh, uh, work being done by uh, artificial intelligence. Next slide, please. So, um, just to, to uh, I take no pleasure in making it more complicated, but just to make it a bit more complicated, I want to point out that these changes and more are also occurring within a process that many uh, view as a as a transitional moment in which the dynamics that have will, have been built up globally since 1970s, which we came to call globalization, uh, contemporary globalization, and which I personally worked in uh, for uh, for much of this period, has begun to significantly change for, as a result of a whole set of factors. And as it changes, the, the way that it affects the higher education process uh, throughout the world is beginning to be articulated differently, differentially, I'm sorry, depending on a whole variety of factors, uh, not the least of which is um, what we've seen in many parts of the globe as emergent nationalism, uh, most spectacularly uh, perhaps in, in terms of uh, 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 China. Uh, but also in terms of uh, places like Hungary and Poland and uh, Czechoslovakia uh, and, uh, and global capital concentration. We live in a world in which uh, global capital is concentrated more than it's ever been in uh, perhaps in recordable human history. Uh, I, uh, in, in order not to make this uh, too long, I chose not to put in a couple of slides here. Uh, showing the extraordinary degree to which uh, uh, wealth is concentrated, uh, not only uh, in the United States and, and Western Europe, but uh, throughout the world, where less than half a percent of the global population uh, owns uh, more than 80% uh, of the wealth, uh, an unprecedented degree of, um, of uh, capital concentration. And in the context of this technological change, that's being uh, invested in ways that um, have, have changed the face of how we uh, make things, how we service things, how we communicate, uh, indeed how society operates uh, in, 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 in general. So um, these, these three things together create uh, an enormous package in and of themselves into which we then enter uh, the pandemic. Next, please. So uh, higher education as we know it will uh, change as a result of the pandemic. And here I just uh, have a couple of uh, minor ways, uh, not minor in, 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 uh, uh, in what they are, but uh, minor in the limited uh, in, in terms of the list that could be offered here, which is quite substantial. Um, restrictions on physical mobility, both within countries and between countries. We've already seen that. Uh, the United States, which uh, has become higher education, which has become significantly dependent upon international students, uh, has uh, simply seen uh, the brakes be put on. Uh, famous universities, uh, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, uh, the University of Washington, uh, on, on and on, Wisconsin, uh, have been uh, forced to reconsider how they're going to run their graduate programs uh, because the uh, degree of international students are not there. And as I'll talk about uh, later, this is ha having an extraordinary impact on uh, higher education finance. Um, so in Asia, one of the things I've been uh, involved in through my Japanese colleagues is uh, the UMED program, Universal Mobility, uh, University Mobility in Asia and Pacific. Uh, and we've been trying to figure out uh, how that works uh, in, in the midst of the pandemic. Does it end? Does it become virtual, uh, et cetera? 
Uh, we'll come back to that a little bit later. So um, if you look at a university as a set of, uh, and I confess much to my uh, uh, chagrin that I was an administrator uh, in my own university for many years, but if you look at the conventional uh, things uh, that universities do, which uh, include recruitment, registration, provision of in-place classroom activities, et cetera, uh, all of these are being uh, interrupted uh, and new ways are being sought uh, to do that. At, at my own university, uh, we are seemingly coming out with uh, uh, new modalities every year, I'm, I'm sorry, every, every week, and in part, we're doing that because we have no idea what the input function is going to look like. And my sense is that that's true for much of higher education throughout the world, is that we can't figure out what to do in place during that portion of the process where we're meant to be educating students because we really don't have a good understanding of what the input model uh, is, who's gonna be where, when, and uh, with what capabilities. So, uh, and I, I just pointed that out a little bit further, interruptions, regular schedule engagements between students and faculty, and equally important, the interruptions in student culture itself, um, which uh, all of us who have been in higher education for a number of years realize uh, is equally important to whatever it is that goes on within the classroom, is the fact that uh, in their identity, in their their transforming identities, which are uh, which are created largely by their in mutual interaction, students come to see themselves in terms of that new identity. Um, if we look um, in the United States, which is the model that I uh, know best, but I've just been uh, giving uh, input from my uh, Japanese colleagues as well. Uh, they're trying to figure out how we use the um, on-campus environment, which after all is uh, historically where we've had most of our money and investment. Uh, we've got all of this physical plant. How do we use it? Uh, some of you may have seen the uh, proposal by uh, Harvard, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, Yale was uh, looking at a similar one in which they would have freshmen and sophomores uh, on the campus during the fall semester, but juniors and seniors during the uh, spring semester because they would be, the seniors would be facing graduation. And in the off semester, they would be involved uh, almost exclusively in uh, online education. Next slide, please. So uh, moving beyond these, let me suggest uh, uh, three macro uh, effects that, that come from these. Next slide. First is to look more carefully at, uh, at the economic uh, dislocation and to, um, uh, one, one is to look at the impacts on the gross domestic product. Uh, and to see that graduation, the graduation of students into a society uh, in which they're expected to bring with them something that contributes to that society over time is gonna be interrupted, is being interrupted in a way that we find hard to uh, calculate and put together into a model, uh, if only because we don't know how long uh, the pandemic will last and um, by the uh, arrival of a turning point, how much it will have uh, given everything that we've talked about to this moment, affected um, the society into which our graduates uh, would go. Um, but realistically, it is the case that um, the gross domestic product is going to sink significantly. I've been looking at stuff today uh, and over the past week, which suggests that uh, GDP could be reduced as much as uh, 7 to 15 percent uh, over the next couple of years, which is a, a massive amount. Another uh, second is uh, the notion of institutional dependency. 
uh, how is it that higher education institutions uh, survive, period? Uh, and the answer is at some level not very complicated. There are about five major sources of uh, funding. Uh, one is uh, tuition uh, from students. Much larger one for public institutions, of course, is uh, public support from, from uh, the government, central or state in the United States. And as the pandemic affects uh, the economic turndown, what we're going to see and already uh, are beginning to see are, are significantly reduced estimates of the amount of money that's going to be available for higher education uh, in the United States, where we had um, a uh, economic downturn from 2006 to 2008, uh, state universities, those who uh, uh, get their, their funding primarily from their state governments, with some from the federal government as well, suffered significant economic uh, restrictions and, um, and, that, and, and never fully recovered from it throughout the, uh, uh, the subsequent decade and uh, responded to that by and large by um, raising tuition. And uh, once you begin to raise tuition, you have a whole other set of factors, as we all know, uh, based upon who can uh, gain success from, uh, from raising tuition and who can't. So the, uh, the, the second is this transformation in uh, institutional dependency. And then the third is the, um, the, the whole question of, uh, again, of, of mobility uh, is what does it mean to be mobile in higher education? Um, and if we wanted to do a detailed analysis of that, we could talk about how, how much mo the faculty are predicated upon mobility. Uh, faculty are meant to go to international meetings, meant to publish uh, in the international journals. Uh, their uh, promotion and tenure is based upon uh, such things, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. To what extent um, do we replace that if in fact the pandemic doesn't allow us to be mobile, uh, et, et cetera? So um, the economic uh, dislocation, I put these down here in part, uh, just in the hope that they might stimulate uh, you all in your insights that are significantly different than mine uh, to make your own list, for example, uh, in the context of the Philippines to uh, talk about how the economic dislocation might be uh, experienced. Next slide, please. The second major uh, effect will be in the disruptions of the faculty and the student flow. Uh, and uh, we looked at some of the questions that came in uh, pr prior to this that we'll be picking up uh, toward the end of this uh, first session. And um, we can see that many of them have to do with the uh, transformation from face-to-face -face, uh, activity into some kind of distance learning. And um, all, all we can say about that at the, at the time is that uh, it would seem from uh, what, uh, uh, what we observe is that uh, maybe 10 to 15% of most institutions were um, somewhat set up to uh, operate in this way, but for many of them, uh, it was not. In Hawaii, for example, which uh, is a much uh, smaller archipelago in terms of number of islands than the Philippines, uh, we, had, uh, we have a, a state university with 11 campuses on all the islands. And so we had developed a system of distance education where students uh, have uh, what we call blended uh, curricula, which are partially face-to-face -face and uh, 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 in part uh, conducted by, um, uh, by distance. And so um, one of the things we will have to do is to try to find, figure out what we've learned from that, what works and what doesn't work, and then to go to the far more difficult thing that we'll talk about later. Um, which is uh, trying to figure out how to 
um, do this uh, with faculty. And by and large, uh, with, with the exception of very, very few universities in the world, uh, what we mean by um, a good and experienced uh, teacher at the university level is one who is um, effective, sensitive um, in uh, reading the classroom to uh, determine the relevance and receptivity of his or her uh, presentation, uh, to understand what the students are getting and not getting, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and we have rewarded historically um, uh, professors for doing this in, in the United States, once again, which is an evaluation system that I'm most familiar with. We have uh, a model which rewards uh, research for promotion and tenure, uh, but equally rewards um, uh, teaching. And we have complex uh, instruments that have been developed to uh, assist us in, uh, in, in uh, setting up teaching association. <laughs> Forgive me for hesitating for a minute, but it's raining very hard right now. And uh, uh, it's really uh, a tiny bit distracting to me. So, um, Distance education, uh, in, in all of the forms that I'm familiar with, and I confess that uh, I'm learning uh, more every day, simply requires different skill sets. Uh, and they're gonna take explicit training and learning on the part of all involved. My own university for, well, 15, 20 years, has had a center for teaching excellence on our, uh, all of our campuses. And uh, increasingly, as the pandemic became uh, uh, prevalent in its uh, implications for all of us, uh, we found that we had to turn to them uh, more and more to recognize that uh, distance education was not going to be an add-on to our system, but in many respects would become a primary uh, vehicle uh, for doing things. Um, now, I have said this primarily, uh, overwhelmingly out of the context of the classroom situation. Uh, when we are in laboratory situations, uh, in the sciences, it becomes uh, much more problematic. Although, as we'll uh, talk about briefly in the next section, it is a place where artificial intelligence is beginning to make uh, significant uh, inroads. Next slide, please. So I think that uh, we're all standing on a precipice um, in which the, uh, the pace of innovation in virtual learning is uh, rapidly picking up. Prior to the pandemic, as I tried to indicate earlier with my remarks about AI, there was um, a significant movement in the direction of um, the, the use of um, virtual devices to uh, expand um, higher education and higher education research. And it is uh, the case that the pandemic has simply thrust that forward in a way that no one anticipated. Uh, at the governmental level, um, we have been slow in producing uh, the resources that uh, might make this uh, available. Um, and uh, particularly since uh, many governmental resources are currently being uh, at, at both the lower education and higher education level being focused on, um, as I uh, tried to suggest earlier, what we do with the physical plant and how we move um, the education environment from the physical plant to um, uh, to the student. And consequently, the how has not included all that much um, research on uh, the innovation that will occur in virtual learning. But in many places, this has uh, begun to happen. 
and um, and and there uh, will be uh, more happening. I, I say I think it's on the next slide that one of the things that a crisis does is to help us to do things that are suddenly necessary uh, where yesterday and the day before we could not do them because of all of the uh, established interests which had uh, kept them from uh, from being so. Um, I have been interested in looking at uh, some novel AI solutions uh, a notion that is uh, has uh, become to emerge uh, in the United States at the primary level and secondary level. And that's the notion of having an artificial intelligence uh, a tutor of some kind for every learner. Uh, and if we have time, we can come back to this, but let me simply mention two. One is an experiment which is uh, just finishing its first five years of operation uh, in uh, uh, one of the eastern states of the United States in which uh, every uh, primary school student was given uh, an iPad and they were taught to read on the iPad and uh, that, that was not so much interesting. What was interesting was that the research endeavor of which this was a part then utilized the student's input of that to individualize the learning style of each uh, student. It then sought to create a, uh, an intervention or, or a methodology, if you will, uh, for that student based upon his or her learning capacities. Uh, so if Dean uh, learns one way and Jane learns another way, Dean gets instructed in a way which is different from Jane. And this has become um, talked about in, in the literature is uh, the notion of having uh, AI tutors for every learners. More recently, um, and I should have put this uh, in, in the references, but, but I forgot, but it's e easily found, I think, on, uh, on Google, is uh, the notion for higher education that is not unreasonable that every student would have uh, an AI tutor. Uh, so you would uh, enter a university as a, as a first year student and as part of your introduction to that and as part of the instruction process to that, uh, you would be um, uh, affected with, uh, or, or I'm sorry, associated uh, with the AI, AI tutor who would be um, targeted specific for uh, your learning needs, your desires, and your capabilities. Next slide, please. So um, just to turn to some things that we uh, might do uh, focused on, on these categories, what can we do for students? Uh, first of all is start earlier providing the skills that will be essential for higher education. Um, so start distance learning uh, as a required skill at uh, the secondary school level, uh, perhaps the primary school level. Uh, when we looked at some of the prior questions that came in and perhaps will be asked later, we saw a lot of questions about uh, how, how do we get involved in distance learning. And I think uh, schools everywhere, governmental systems everywhere, uh, will realize that providing uh, the infrastructure uh, for this, the physical infrastructure for this, is a constant, is a necessary public benefit, uh, and higher education systems will uh, realize that rather than taking a major part of their learning time and effort to uh, engage in having secondary students and and the professoriate for gaining new skills. Uh, that it needs to be a revised skill uh, at the secondary level. Uh, the second is to revise uh, existing curricula. And I think this is a far more important issue, uh, but it's also, as we simply learn from the history of uh, studying higher education, extraordinarily difficult, is um, to look at all uh, of our higher education majors or, or uh, ways that we've organized uh, the institution um, and look at the kinds of changes which are occurring both as a result of AI and the pandemic and their effects on the workforce 
and then to integrate them with each other so that they reinforce and provide more socially meaningful education for the students. Uh, in my own university, I was a dean for many years in the social sciences, uh, and I found it extremely difficult uh, to get the departments to share uh, experiences, to work together, to have a sense that um, they were all part of a uh, social science tradition, which shouldn't just be acknowledged in passing, uh, but needed to be an active part of the curricula. And I think we're at a turning point in history where that's no longer to be gainsaid. Uh, we simply have to recognize that um, if higher education is going to be socially meaningful for students, it has to be directly tied to uh, the events and activities which are occurring in the society. Um, and that uh, will cause us to revise all kinds of existing boundaries, including those between graduate and undergraduate education. We've already seen that happening in American education uh, simply by um, the, the demands of, of technology change. Uh, but the whole, I think we need to rethink uh, the, the whole notion of this. And I've got one further thing to say about that later on. Uh, we need to adapt to the technological imperatives by giving the necessary equipment for both students and faculty. Um, we have been reluctant to do that in American universities, thinking that it was largely the faculty's responsibility in many respects and the students' responsibility in many respects to do it themselves. And, um, and we can't do that any longer to, to the point that, for example, it's quite common in American universities and in government uh, facilities as well, where we do have uh, uh, technology centers, uh, the, uh, the, they, they lag behind technologically to what is happening uh, in the outside world. So they become obsolete uh, very quickly. And in digital environments, uh, this can happen easily, but it's uh, devastating. And then finally, to ensure that national education institutions are increasingly tied into uh, international linkages. Uh, so uh, we, we, we are moving seamlessly into a phenomenon uh, of, um, of, of what could literally be called international higher education. And we need to see that uh, as a content and network rather than as uh, something which is affected by specific institutions. Next, please. So uh, the faculty to uh, say uh, the obvious that we've been, I've been drumming on, we need to teach learning distance skills. Um, uh, younger faculty have an enormous advantage of this over older faculty uh, and, um, and the rewards in our institutions have not been uh, arranged in such a way uh, to provide that. We need to move away from one size fits all teaching modalities, uh, the large lecture hall uh, classes, uh, to small, smaller directed impact engagements with students. Uh, if you're a university administrator, the cost benefit analysis for this is staggering. Um, why were those huge lecture halls there in the first place? Because, you know, it's some kind of uh, institutional metric. They were cheaper. Uh, it costs a lot of money institutionally uh, to put faculty directly um, in, in uh, engagements with students, um, et cetera. We have to revise our curricula to focus um, on both the dynamics and effect of these changing. Uh, charging the social science uh, sciences, for example, with investigations of how to live productively uh, with value in a change world. Uh, for those of us who are in the social sciences, we spent much of the last several decades trying to separate what we called empirical analysis, positivistic analysis from normative analysis, uh, believing that that gave us a superior view, uh, analytical view of the world. It uh, gives us some advantages, but it, uh, I think, has uh, proved its day. Uh, and increasingly, the social sciences and the humanities will be asked to utilize higher education discourse to figure out how people should live in a world which is significantly impacted 
by the, the events of uh, artificial intelligence and the pandemic. If it is the case that 40% of the workforce is not going to have jobs, we need to ask ourselves, how should that 40% of the population find value in society? Uh, and if left to our own devices, what will happen is that those who have higher education will have higher status and those who don't have higher education will not, a dynamic which is already present. Uh, but if we don't do something about it, it will get significantly worse and we'll find ourselves with uh, societies which are far more divided uh, than they are now. And then finally, in this regard, um, I happen to uh, come from uh, a department at the University of Hawaii, which was one of the leaders in the world uh, to create an academic major in future studies. Um, and uh, it has proved to be enduring and timely and purposeful. Uh, and I think that we need to add futuring, not only as a part of uh, what the social sciences do uh, uh, in the world, uh, but as a regular and mindful endeavor of the academy. Where, where are we going? Uh, what is all of, uh, all of this about? Once again, the dual disruptors of AI and the pandemic uh, reset. Next slide, please. So uh, what should the administration do? Uh, the administration needs to work diligently and creative with all its partners to anticipate and promote responses to various changing environments. Um, easily said, hard done. Uh, perhaps those uh, that will require the most um, uh, concentration are those who are in changing aspects of the working environment um, and once again, this is a subject uh, measure unto itself that we could spend a significant amount of time. But um, we need to develop and employ sensitive job estimation software and frame curriculum offerings uh, to accord to these. We've done something like this at the system level at the University of Hawaii. I put the URL here for those of you who might be interested. Um, it is a wonderful little uh, device which looks at our economy is small enough that this is more easily done, very hard to do in a larger economy. But it looks at the jobs which are available and would, which will come to be available. Uh, uh, let me add that it was done at the community college level, which is very job focused, but I think it needs to expand to four year institutions as well in a different format. As we literally have to ask the question, what, what are we educating people for? Um, and this is a tool that allows us to do that. Uh, if there can be um, 20 jobs in um, construction management uh, over the next uh, two to four years, then we try not to graduate uh, 80 people uh, in construction management, et cetera, et cetera. Um, based upon the ongoing and creative um, sets of processes that we're reviewing, we need to revise and reinvent the existing financial models. Again, uh, easily said, hard to do, goodness only knows, hard to do. But in the words of, uh, of Joni Finney uh, uh, from the Walton uh, School, uh, looking at the pandemic, she simply said, the existing financial model of education is broken. Uh, that's simple, it's broken. And um, if we don't, learn to fix it, if we don't try to fix it, if we don't take it as a fundamental responsibility for fixing it, uh, it, it it's not going to get fixed. Uh, so it needs to go on the forefront. And I think uh, university administrations, trustees, uh, those in depart governmental departments of education um, have got to uh, sit down and ask themselves in a way that uh, which is quite different from the way their discourses normally go on. Uh, how do we how do we fix it? Uh, what 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 can we propose? What what could be new? What can we learn from other societies that uh, are doing it better uh, than we? So um, just to finish, uh, here are the references that uh, uh, I used, and uh, I have many more. Uh, in, in all of these uh, endeavors. 
if you are interested and you wish to uh, send me a, an email, uh, deann at hawaii.edu, I'd be happy to respond to you by uh, providing uh, other uh, kinds of uh, readings. So I think we can move from this to the Q&A portion. Thank you very much, Dean, for that uh, very insightful and very informative uh, talk that you had. I'm sure our audience have uh, learned a lot from, from you this afternoon. Uh, so now let's go to the second part of the program, which is the question and answer. Uh, for, uh, for the audiences, you may uh, send your questions in through the comment section below. And for the meantime, we'll uh, I'll first ask the question sent to us uh, during the pre-registration. Dean, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, tackle the first question. So this is from Gladie May Delmo. Uh, she's a student. Uh, in this time, we encounter uh, different insights about the pandemic and how we can help each other to grow and, and unite our relationship to attain higher level of education between this trying time. Uh, wonderful question. I think that um, the beginning of the question suggests the first part of the answer, uh, which is that we have encountered different insights about the pandemic. And we can begin by sharing those insights. So if we can create uh, conversation channels uh, to do that, uh, whether those are uh, on a university campus, whether those are within networks, uh, whatever, uh, the sharing of intelligence and insight is, I think, uh, in every environment, the beginning of effective education. Uh, and so that that's important. Uh, how do we grow and unite it in a relationship to attain higher level of education uh, in this trying time? Uh, I think, once again, if we can take some of the things that I suggested in the presentation, as uh, beginning stages for a conversation is to begin to ask some of these difficult questions, uh, particularly the questions which combine the uh, uh, dislocating effects of AI and the pandemic. If this is happening, for example, it's not gonna go away because I turn my back and look somewhere else. Uh, it's gonna become part of our new reality how do I, we operate in this new reality? My own experience in life and with my own students over a history of teaching uh, begins with asking the question, um, what do I want from life and why do I want it? Um, that should be the framework of, in my point of view, from, from all of education. And it is something for which there's not a, a one-time answer it's an answer which is constantly in development, uh, constantly mobile in one's thinking, uh, et cetera. But it is a, a, a fundamentally important question. One last point. And I hope Grady May uh, is, is uh, asking it in this context. Um, you can only ask the question charitably if you're willing to accept the answer. Uh, so when we ask people for their opinion, um, even though it doesn't agree with ours, you know, we have to respect them that they've answered us. Uh, and so my hope in, in uh, the crisis of the pandemic is that we learn to listen to each other better uh, and that we can really hear people say, this is what I need, this is what I want, and this is why I want it. Uh, and how does that work with you? So I think if that kind of discourse, conversation can be initiated, we can then ask the question about our institutions. Uh, what does my university do that perhaps yours doesn't, et cetera, et cetera. And we have a basis for beginning to, uh, to, to figure that out. Thank you for your answer, Dean. Uh, next question is from Ms. Eden Bolido. 
uh, what are the best strategies to be done to higher education in the post-pandemic? Should curriculum be aligned and adjusted to the new normal? Uh, a fundamental question, in, and, and uh, Stephanie, uh, and I tried to answer that in my presentation. I think the best strategies are to, um, depending on where we are in higher education, if we're in the social sciences, for example, I think we need to ask the question, what have we done well and what have we done poorly? A, and be honest about that. B, how is the world to which the social sciences are addressed changing? And how do we know that? And as a result of those changes, how could we change our curricula to better affect that. So were we to have only that conversation, I think that I would want to start it by asking the question, what might we mean by a new normal? And my answer would be, is we don't have a clue. We don't have a clue because we don't know where we're going in the pandemic. And as I tried to make clear in the presentation, we don't know how this other revolution that we're in the middle of, the industrial revolution, is going to affect the world in which we live. So given the fact that we don't know so much, what can we do? And part of that is to talk to each other in a respectful way about what are the important questions? What are the right questions to ask in a situation such as this? Um, your answer in the Philippines is going to be different from our answer in Hawaii. Our answer in Hawaii clearly is different from what's going on on the U.S. mainland. I'm working uh, simultaneously with projects in um, uh, Japan, Hong Kong, South Korea, and China uh, for very different answers. So the... Uh, the, the, the conversation, and I keep calling it that because I think that's what it is, the conversation needs to be focused specifically on where you are. Thank you, Dean. Uh, next question from Joanna Pabilona. How can a higher education institution sustain quality of education with distance learning, especially to students that need competencies in uh, experiential skills? What a great question. Uh, I think there are uh, a three-part three, three part answer. One is that we have to be very frank and very candid about who has distance learning skills and who doesn't. And that exists on both the faculty level and the student level. And so the first job, I think, of all of our universities is to, to bring us up to an acceptable level. And that means putting aside a lot of the things that we would like to do. Like, I want to teach my political science class. Well, it's unrealistic to teach my political science class if half of my students don't really know how to uh, or myself, how, how to master uh, distance education in an effective way. And uh, it is also fatuous if, um, if the wherewithal is not there. Uh, we have become so comfortable over the last decades in the realization that our responsibility to teaching our students depends on who's sitting in that seat when I open the door. Um, and that's exactly what the pandemic has interrupted. Uh, it's not that I'm opening the door to see the student. It's the fact that the student is out there and can't get to the door. Um, and many of these students will not have the technology. They won't have um, uh, the linkages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the first problem. It's a very un unglamorous, fundamental um, a problem, uh, but one that I think uh, ha has to be addressed successfully. Otherwise, the rest of it uh, is, is silly. Then to the second part of the question, um, to, um, to, to 
get those students that need the competencies and experiential skills. I'm not entirely sure how to unpack that because I can see several meanings to experiential skills. But if what Joanna means is um, working within the medium that we have here for, or the media that we have for distance education, then again, you go back to where I was before, we have to put those, those students at the front of the line. And if you happen to be someone who's as talented as you are, Gene, in making these technologies work, guess what? You get to go to the back of the line <laughs> because you already know this stuff. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's an inversion of our normal academic conceit, whether we, we admit it or not, that rewards, quote unquote, the best student. Um, and we always have some notion in an environment as to who the better student is. I would perhaps, um, <laughs> at the risk of opening up uh, yet another uh, difficult conversation, uh, say that in this instance, in order to respond to this question appropriately, we need to come up with a notion of what the deserving student is. And the deserving student, uh, ironically, may be the student who has the most needs. Uh, so we have to, uh, A, agree that a certain threshold level is required to promote equity in the classroom situation, in the remote classroom situation. B, put our resources there and after we have passed uh, an acceptable threshold, proceed with the um, learning content of whatever that module is. Thank you, Dean. Uh, next question. Sorry. Uh, any recommendations on how we can make our students ready to face the future amidst the pandemic? How can we guide them in the biggest adjustments that they will uh, take soon? Hmm. What a great question. Um, well, I'm going to give an answer which may be um, so focused on Dean's view of the world that it could be irrelevant to somebody else. Uh, but um, I think in order to get ready to face the future, of anything, you need to have a good model of the future. And if you don't, um, I think you got to get one. So um, I made a remark just at the end of my presentation about uh, future studies uh, at, at the University of Hawaii. Um, but I was also uh, involved with higher education accreditation for a long time, uh, 25 years, uh, across the United States and, and internationally as well. And I know that there are lots of different ways in which universities try to study possible futures. The weakness of many of these processes is that they don't involve students. And I think that, uh, so three things are, are required. I think there has to be uh, a process and a discipline that allows you to talk sensibly about how to face any future. Uh, what, what is futurism uh, in, in anything, whether it's engineering or, what I've suggested, AI or medicine or, or whatever. Um, secondly, <clears throat> what skills are required to make sensible inquiry within that arena? So can I talk sensibly about public health in East Asia without knowing anything about public health in East Asia? I don't think so. Thirdly, once you have a framework in those skills, do you then have a, and, and I'm gonna use this notion, a theory of the future that makes sense. 
And the very essence of the pandemic is that it scrambles that. That's what I tried to do in the slides about uh, uh, 19, 1918. It was unprecedented. People, any future that people invented didn't work. So we're a little bit in that situation now. And I think what we have to do is to counsel ourselves and coach ourselves in being what I would call radically contingent. And what I mean by that is contingent means to be aware of the alternatives which are facing you under any situation and being willing to be informed by that. Being radically contingent, in my view, is at whatever level you customarily do that, you have to be self-conscious about ramping it up. So just think about the pandemic. Uh, and I wanna go to the grocery store. Normally uh, the grocery store is not too far from the house. I walk out of my house, uh, I get in the car, I go down to the grocery store, I get my stuff, I come back home. Hmm, now the pandemic's here. I cannot tell you how many times I've got to my car and had to walk back in the house to get my mask because now we're over wearing masks all the time and I can't even get in the grocery store without a mask, et cetera. So, you know, a trivial example, but not so trivial because it's become the new normal. So I think that uh, the, the, uh, the issue here is um, what's the new normal? And how do we learn that and then um, continue to adjust it and then bring our values to it? So my fear here in the United States is that uh, some people get to learn it and many people don't. And, and, and that's a tragedy. Thank you, Dean. Uh, we'll now go to the questions posted live uh, via Facebook and YouTube. First, we have a question from Michelle. Uh, please share some suggestions in conducting classes in physical education and sports activities in school, or virtually, if uh, applying now in the- <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, right. Um, well, let me tell you, uh, our, our daughter has just come home from New York City. God love her. You know, she, she escaped. Uh, and so she's living with us. And I get up at seven o'clock in the morning and she's got a mat in the living room and she's got her phone on and she's doing her Pilates in the living room. Where's her instructor in New York City, right? So one of the things I think we have to do is to, um, Think about what we can do in PE and what we can't do. Uh, so with respect to sports activities, what we're seeing in the United States with teams is that if you get team activity going too soon, you're off the court soon because you've got an outbreak of COVID-19. So I think that um, what, what, Michelle and her colleagues may have to do is to turn the equation around and say, what is PE for and what are sports activities for? You know, largely they're to make the body, the body physically able and adjustable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then secondly, it is to promote knowledge and thirdly, it's to promote a culture of civility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we do that with, um, uh, with what's in front of us? So I think if we ask those functional questions first, as opposed to, I don't know, how, how, how do you play American football without touching people? <laughs> you know, uh, can't be done. Thank you for that, Dean. Uh, next question we have from Delicano Armada. What can you suggest on how financing in higher education institutions should be done during these times? Do we still believe in angels? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we need our financial angels. 
Um, so in the United States, what this is really a tough question because it depends on what part of financing we're focused on. If we're talking about how do you run a campus, for example? Uh, the time-honored first thing to do, I had the pleasure or duty or misfortune to run a campus for some time. And one of the first things you do on a campus when you have a shortcut in funding is you reduce repairs and maintenance. But then you're just deferring the problem into the future. Um, the overall first thing that comes to mind, well, th three things, uh, uh, let me do it this way. One is uh, the time-honored method, find new sources of funding. Uh, and if you're uh, in a state institution, you are dependent upon those people who create and institute the budget. But what's going on throughout the United States is that people are being willing in some respects to create deficit spending in order to do that. The second thing that you do is to um, prioritize what you're spending money on and make a decision based upon the values of that institution as to how to contract rationally. Uh, does that mean that some damage is going to be? Of course, you know, that that's what it means to have a crisis. Um, thirdly, what can happen and what a limited number of institutions can do because the overall market is uh, is abused is to um, invest new forms of income. So in an American institution where we have things called continuing education to reach out into the community, we would try on a very timely basis to say, where are the real needs? And let's get some courses out there and bring that income into the institution, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is that when you have a pandemic, the need is so great and it's spread over such a broad area that it really requires um, commitment from the center. Uh, otherwise it's uh, the marginal responses are likely to be ineffective. I'm sorry that's such a weak answer, but only because it's such a great question. Thank you, Dean. And next we have a question from YouTube, from Renovic. What will be the role of ethics in virtual or online learning in a post-pandemic higher education? Um, I, I think central and, and there, there are no easy answers to that, but let me suggest that the group that I'm working with at the East West Center has been focused on the overall question of ethics in AI. And as the pandemic has come to affect us, we have begun to expand into the notion of virtual and online learning. So um, I would encourage people to go to the East West Center website. And Gene, I can send you uh, the URL for that and maybe you can make it available uh, to those who are interested in this question. Um, but, but but once again, it's a great question, and it's a great question, and because of that, there are no easy answers. Um, the first important realization 
is that ethics are central. And in much of the way that we live our life in societies, certainly in American higher education, is until something bubbles up, we assume that all of the ethical work has been done already. Uh, and we, we just, you know, our job is to comport ourselves in what we regard as an ethical way and get on with it. Um, and precisely what a pandemic does is to interrupt that logic, the, the moral logic of, of that. Um, and so a whole host of questions emerge immediately. What should be done? For whom should it be done? Who should do it? Who should pay for it? What should, you know, what outcomes should be prohibited? What, yada, 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 all the way down the line. And that's why we started this, uh, this project. Um, and, but as I say, I'll send you the URL. And then um, there, uh, there are some papers that are available uh, to me about ethics in um, uh, AI related things. And um, would I pronounce the name properly if I said Rinovic? Renovic, uh, if um, I were to, yeah, that's were to contact me directly, I'd be happy to uh, send something also. Thank you, Dean. Uh, you may send me the URL and I'll make it available to our participants mm -hmm. later after the webinar. Um, we have another question here from Facebook uh, from Rosemary. What can teachers do to help soften the effects of learning isolation that students may feel during this pandemic? Um, Rosemary, I'm going to give you an answer that uh, maybe is not what you anticipated. Uh, play games. Um, we, we, we give so much attention to getting the job done in higher education, um, focusing on the product, evaluating the product, grading the product, et cetera, that we uh, forget that learning can be a lot of fun. Uh, there are lots of different ways to do it. Uh, and working in small groups uh, collaboratively, uh, playing games, uh, inventing games, uh, so uh, let me tell Rosemary, if I could, just one brief personal illustration from my own teaching career. I had um, a, a group of students that, I was teaching a course called Politics and the Novel. And uh, what we did was to take um, eight fairly well-known novels and analyze them, discuss them during the course of the semester. But I didn't know how to do the typical evaluation. How do you do an exam on something like that? So I said to my students, um, I'll give you a choice. Um, you can either write me a piece of fiction um, as a requirement for the examination of the course. And I'll tell you whether it's any good or not based on my standards or uh, if you insist upon having uh, the conventional uh, evaluation, I'll set out, figure out how you would write a term paper. Best course I ever taught. Uh, I'm out of that class of 13 people. I made seven lifelong friends uh, who still write to me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one, one went on to become a professional writer, uh, et cetera. So that was, you know, at that particular moment with nothing to recommend it, um, a game that I invented with them. Uh, and I'm sure Rose, Rosemary is clever, vastly more clever than I uh, in engaging the students in a playful way. Um, but it, um, it, it's just remarkable how if you allow them to be in charge of the thing, uh, how it motivates them. Thank you, Dean. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we have um, one last more one last question 
from Facebook. Okay. This is from Aliana. Uh, do you agree that online learning is inclusive? How to convince uh, students that online learning is inclusive compared to what most Filipinos are thinking that the unpri- underprivileged will be left behind? Oh. Aliana, that's three questions. <laughs> Masquerading as <laughs> one. Um, I would say that often the way online learning is done, it's not inclusive. Does that mean that it cannot be? No, I think it can be. I think to make online learning inclusive requires a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of personal contact. Um, In effect, to use a conventional language that I think we would all uh, recognize, you end up tutoring. Uh, And in most of our classroom situations, if we can break them down to giving tutoring to the student, that's a real benefit. They're getting a lot from that. Um, And I just don't know what most Filipinos are thinking about the underprivileged that will be left behind if it means are you underprivileged in the context of the pandemic by virtue of the fact that you have to be online that's pretty complicated if it means something else which was in one of the previously uh, uh, entered questions that you sent to me namely that poorer students do not have access to the internet and to online learning that's another subject entirely And it's a social responsibility of the government to uh, respond to that directly. And I don't think there's any solution to that other than to have some uh, public trust uh, authority in charge of that. I hope that helps, uh, Eliana, but but I think it can be significantly inclusive. Thank you very much, Dean. Uh, once again, thank you for accepting our invitation uh, to be our resource speaker for this afternoon. I'm sure our audience, both in Facebook and um, YouTube, has learned a lot from you. Um, any parting words for our audience? Uh, first of all, I want to thank you and uh, my uh, friends at the ministry for sending me the invitation. Uh, my Significant regret is that it's been much too long since I've uh, been able to enjoy being in the Philippines. Uh, And uh, what I would like to say, if there is a final word, is to, um, is not to underestimate the pandemic. Um, What we're seeing in the United States today is the consequence of doing that. And the consequence of politicizing it in a needless manner, um, the pandemic doesn't care where you are on the political spectrum. The pandemic doesn't care whether you wear a mask or not. The pandemic, the virus is affected by whether you wear a mask or not. Virus is affected by whether you socially distance or not, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, ultimately, wherever we are, we're all in this together. Thank you very much once again, Dean, and good night in Hawaii time. Good night. Have a good day. Thank you. So that ends our webinar for this afternoon. We hope to see you in our next and future web- future sessions. To those who have pre-registered, we will be sending you a feedback form within an hour after this broadcast. And once completed, we will send an electronic copy of your certificate. You will only have until 5 p.m. on August 3 to respond to the feedback form. Once again, this has been uh, Jean Hesuro from the HEPBO project of the, communi- of the Commission of Higher Education uh, on behalf of uh, my director, uh, Director Nalia Aybin, and our commissioner. Our commissioners and Chair Popoy de Vera, we wish you a good afternoon and have a great day.